Good morning and good evening. And also, konnichiwa, everyone. I'm Ibun, a CEO of World Road and One Young World Ambassador. Welcome to the SDG Global Festival of Action from Japan. We're actually in Tokyo right now. Well, I'm actually in Tokyo right now. Today, we'll be discussing financing for climate action. For those watching at home, you can join the conversation on social media by using the hashtag, hashtag turn it around with big T, I, and A. First of all, I want to start my opening with this topic. The disruption caused by the COVID-19 has reinforced the interdependencies and connectivity of our economy, society, and environment. While the pandemic left millions jobless, we have seen the worst crash of the stock market last March, followed by a massive injection by central banks and later a stock market boom in the States and others in a short period of time. As we start to bounce back from the pandemic, it is clear that our growth has not, was not sustainable and we must find a way to balance our financial system with economic, social, and environmental outcomes all together at the same time. We are now at a turning point for people in our planet and our financial system must be on the same page to deliver SDGs, which have been subjected to a drastic setback due to the pandemic. In 2020, UNDP has established and managed um, the SDG impact, a common framework for the investors and enterprises to measure, manage, and communicate the SDG contribution in a consistent, in transpa transparent manner. Despite the global recession, growing interest in sustainable investing is now a clear sign that the investors, enterprises also recognize need for a system to really change. In this session, Financing for Climate Change, Climate Action, we'll be welcoming three experts in sustainable finance to deep dive into questions such as, what is the role of finance in the face of climate change? What are some practical ways to aim for a financial system to align with the SDGs and green recovery? And now please welcome our lovely, lovely guests, Ken Mr. Ken Shibusawa, CEO of Shibusawa and Company, and also a committee member of UNDP SDG Impact. Also Mr. Johann Schmidtman, Deputy Head of the IMF Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. And lastly, Ms. Trista Bridges, co-founder of ReDeer. Before starting, we would like to ask Johan from IMF to give a quick introduction on, on global economic outlook post COVID and why sustainable finance and green recovery matter. Johan, uh, please welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ibun. Uh, thank you very much to UNDP for organizing this great event. It is very timely and a very important topic. I'm going to make brief remarks about the global economic outlook, the economic situation, and then also why sustainable and green finance matters. Unfortunately, the COVID-19 virus has killed more than a million people, and left tens of millions unemployed, especially among low-skilled workers, women, and youth. The associated economic recession due to voluntary social distancing, as well as lockdown measures, has been deep. In fact, economic growth has contracted more and faster in this recession than in previous recessions, including the global financial crisis. Fortunately, in many countries, there was a very swift economic policy response. This included fiscal support, measures such as extended unemployment support, payments to households, and help for businesses. Central banks also stepped in, providing monetary support and liquidity to ease financing conditions for businesses and households and support financial markets. The strong policy support has prevented a much worse economic meltdown. We can now see light at the end of the tunnel, thanks to the tremendous success of researchers around the world creating vaccines in record time. Most countries have started their vaccine programs 
in some that are furthest ahead, we can already see the benefits as infection numbers are declining. On the economic side, we've seen a fairly swift initial economic rebound. This year, we will likely see strong economic growth in most countries. However, this of course is a recovery from a low base. It is also uneven within societies and across countries. Especially the poor and vulnerable have been hard hit and recovery here will take longest. And there are also risks and uncertainties that are particularly high, high right now, uh, not least when it comes to COVID-19 developments. Infection rates are still high in many parts of the world and social distancing continues to hold back momentum. The longer term economic consequences of this crisis are particularly worrisome. Poverty and inequality have risen, persistent underemployment and school closures are likely to harm human capital. We haven't seen many bankruptcies because of policy support in most countries, but this may yet come and haunt us. And also we have seen, of course, a surge in debt, both on the government side and in parts of the private sector, and this will add challenges down the road. We need to address these legacies of COVID-19 and seize the opportunity to lay the ground for a more sustainable future. Addressing climate change should be a crucial component of this. Climate change poses an enormous risk to our future, not just for the environment or our health, but also economically. And there's not much time to waste. Achieving emissions neutrality by 2050, a goal that fortunately many countries now have announced, implies global emissions to be cut by one third until 2030. And that is less, of course, than a decade away. So now is the time to invest in a green and sustainable future. Some economies have already taken advantage of crisis-related stimulus and made part of that stimulus at least green, but more is needed. Investments today can pave the way for a low carbon economy. This, for example, means increasing dependence on renewable energy, enhancing energy efficiency, and retrofitting buildings to improve energy conservation. Investment in these sectors, which were growing rapidly even prior to the pandemic, will also help with post-pandemic reorganization of economies, providing investment opportunities for firms and jobs for the unemployed. As we have now seen lower oil prices and depressed demand for fuel because of work from home and limited travel due to the pandemic, it is a very good time to introduce or raise carbon prices, which are essential to provide market signals to allocate capital away from high emission to low emission activities. Analysis by my colleagues in our research department at the International Monetary Fund finds that a comprehensive policy strategy to mitigate climate change through a green investment push, as well as gradually rising carbon prices, could create jobs and lift economic growth. The public sector alone will not be able to stem these funding needs. Private finance will play an important role in this to mobilize enough funding for the transition to a low carbon economy, but as I think also very importantly, to do so in an efficient way. As I mentioned at the beginning, I think our discussion today is extremely timely and I'm very much looking forward to it. Thank you. Thank you, Johan. Um, after listening to your opening, I just realized there's so much, you know, challenges, but then at the same time, there's so many, so much chances that we can, you know, all do together to make an action as well. So hopefully um, from this, you know, session, we can really deep dive into what we can do together and what we can take an action from today. Alrighty, um, as we are running not still out of time. <laughs> I want to um, start the session with an open question. Uh, why does financing for sustainability matter? Um, maybe Ken San, do you want to start with? Sure, thank you, Ibn San. Uh, and thank you for our friends at UNDP Tokyo as well as Global uh, for putting together this wonderful event. Uh, despite COVID, um, we're still connected and that's, that's a great thing. Um, the, the why question, um, the bottom line, I think, is relatively or actually very, very simple um, because the why is that the conditions of the planet, uh, conditions of a business is always changing. And if it's always changing, 
the planet and also the people and also the business need to adapt to that change. And, and change, you need new inventions, you need new discoveries, and for the inventions, for discoveries to have a more wide-reaching uh, market, uh, you need innovation. Uh, and that all requires investment up front. So that's where why the financing comes in for sustainability matters. Thank you, ken -san. How about you, Trista? What's your thought? Why is it important? Thank you, thank you so much, Yvonne san Thank you again for having us all on today uh, for this very important discussion. Um, if you look at what needs to happen in terms of sustainability and sustainability transformation, moving to a sustainable economy, moving to a sustainable world is going to require a massive amount of change, as, as Ken mentioned. And I think that one of the things that's most important to remember is that in order for that change to happen, we need to have financing and we need to make sure that various sectors of our economy are engaged. The UN repeatedly mentions that um, each year we have about a 2.9 trillion US dollar gap in terms of achieving the SDGs. Um, that's a massive amount of money. And so without um, being able to engage finance and to have innovative financial solutions in order to address these problems, we will probably never be able to achieve the goals that we need to achieve. Um, but you know, hopefully, you know, in this discussion, we certainly will discuss some of the solutions uh, that we can look at to help us get there. Mm -hmm. Really, I think we can really invest to make a better world and then also at the same time to make innovation as well, right, everyone? Okay. Yeah. Great, then moving on to the next question. Um, but still, um, even for me, sometimes it's hard to really connect between finance and climate change. Um, could you really tell, tell me, tell us, you know, how does financing relate to climate change, Johan? Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks, Yvonne. I think this relates and, and takes off from what uh, both Tristan and Ken said that um, we will need to make big investments to address climate change. And I see there are two components. First of all, um, there will be some damage from climate change and these damages uh, need to be addressed and that needs to be funded. Second, ideally we want to avoid as many damages as possible and we want to avoid catastrophic climate change in the first place. And that will also require large investments in things such as technology uh, mitigation uh, adjustments and technologies. So I'm thinking here of investments into renewable energy, low emission transport, and energy efficient housing. And when we try to size what is needed in terms of climate finance globally, um, it is a big number. Um, it's probably somewhere around 2.3% of global GDP per year that is reached, that, that is needed to reach the Paris goal of limiting the increase in global temperature to two degrees Celsius. Now that is about two trillion US dollars every year. That sounds like a very large number, but I would argue that it is within reach and it's very much doable um, because let's compare it to global energy investment, which is itself 2% of global GDP every year. So if you just reallocate some of the spending on, on energy to more green purposes, we can already cover a large part of the financing needs for, for climate. Or to give you another comparison, my colleagues at the IMF uh, did a few years back an estimation of the implicit global energy subsidies. These are subsidies that countries give to fossil fuel uh, burning and, and production. And this actually is six and a half percent of global GDP. So you can see it is within reach, although the financing needs are large. And Governments clearly play a big role in tackling climate change. Uh, they need to make investments, they need to set the rules of the game, make regulation, et cetera, set standards. But given the, the magnitude of the financing needs, and also, as I mentioned in the beginning, the need to have the market pick the, the most innovative ideas and fund the right ways to address this problem, we need the private sector come in as well in, in addressing this uh, this big challenge that we are facing. And we really want to tap into the ingenuity of the private sector. Uh, and this is tremendous. We've seen this in, in things such as developing a COVID-19 vaccine in record time or commercializing electronic vehicles. So we really want to tap into that. So from a financial sector perspective, I would argue it makes complete sense to take climate change into account purely from a commercial perspective. 
For example, investors should think twice nowadays about funding new coal power plants that may have to be phased out in a few years because of tighter emission standards or simply because technology for renewables is advancing so fast that coal becomes uncompetitive. A similar example would be electric vehicles, where I think a forward-looking car maker and its investors really needs to think about the end of the combustion engine simply by what we are seeing on the technology side. So my bottom line on this is that it is simply good investment management for the private sector to take the risks and opportunities associated with climate change and the transition to a low carbon economy into account when they make investment decisions. Right. I really realize it is no longer nice to have. It's really a must have to, you know, change this through finance. Thank you, Johan. Um, what's your thought about this, Trista? So, so building on uh, some of the things that Johan said, um, absolutely, we definitely need to make sure that we engage the private sector and can de deploy capital into new and innovative solutions. I would stress as well that a lot of those solutions um, are accelerating fast, but there's many things that are still far away, right? Um, and for businesses to be able to, to grow and to be able to expand around the world, um, they need products that are you know, technically sound, they need products that are well-developed, that can be scaled to markets, and this just simply takes financing. Um, of course, we have in the last you know, 20, 30 years, we've seen the growth of the private equity sector and venture capital specifically in really fueling the technology sector, and they will be critical to engage again. Um, I would say that that sector is maybe used to traditionally investing in things where they could perhaps exit them much more quickly, right? Um, but these are very different. This is a very different scenario. This is a very different type of technology that we're going to have to deal with to tackle climate. So we definitely need their engagement, and we also need um, government's engagement too, right? Because in fueling technology and technology ecosystems around the world, government has also played a really important role in terms of creating. Uh, a space where people can innovate. And what are some of the things they do, can do? They can you know, certainly help with tax credits. They can certainly help with certain grants, particularly for technologies that are much longer term, very risky and very complex. They can basically act as a complement uh, to, and a partner in many ways to private investors as well. So we're definitely seeing a lot of very innovative new funds, for example, coming online now to invest in climate. And that's extremely encouraging. But, but we definitely uh, need a lot more engagement um, to kind of scale up the financing that's available uh, for entrepreneurs around the world. Great, thank you, Trista. Any comments, Kinsan? Sure, the, uh, the how question mm -hmm. is actually a little bit more complex than the why question. Um, and the high qu how question, there, there are comments um, that you know, the government can't do everything, so the private sector needs to bring, come in. So that's, that's obvious, right? Um, but when you say the private sector, though, um, it's, it's a whole wide range of people in the private sector. Um, so you might have the large institutional investors. Um, you may have even yourself, an individual. Um, and you might have short-term investors, you might have long-term investors. So it's, it's actually, when you say the private sector, it's very, very, very complex. Um, but if you get down to it, uh, what is financing? It, it, it's, I think it's a voice because somebody needs to make a decision on something and that's a voice. Um, and so what we're talking about here for climate change and the scope of the, the, the money <clears throat> that needs to come in, um, I think we need to move the large institutional managed money and, but the problem with the institutional managed money is that it's not their own money. Ibn, you have your own money and you can make your decision on what you want to invest in. But as an institutional investor, you have to answer to your client. Let's say you're a pension fund management. You're a long-term investor. Um, you should be worried about <clears throat> climate change. But there's an argument that if for a pension fund management to answer to fiduciary duty you shouldn't be looking at environmental or social issues. You should be just looking at the bottom dollar because that's because <clears throat> you're looking after the fiduciary duty for people receiving pensions in the future. And so there's that argument. But I think if you asked, I took a survey of the people receiving pensions in the futures and say, well, will we, will we provide you with the uh, financial return, you know, but the planet could go down the tubes and, and the social problems we don't worry about. 
would you rather have that world or a world where, well, you're financially secure, but also you and your children and your grandchildren <clears throat> are living in a happier, healthier planet? And I would think most people would say the latter. And so, but the problem is, I think that voice not often is not, is not, is not translated into, into the institutional <clears throat> voice. That's been in the past, but from the, when, when the United Nations came up with the PRI and on, in the last five, 10, 15 years, um, basically the institutional investors, people managing the money says, well, we have a responsibility <clears throat> to our fiduciary, to our clients, but also to the planet as well. And so that voice is starting to change. And if that, that, that voice sets, up, sets the tone, the people that are you know, individuals can get, also get on that board. And so the important thing is, I think having the communication between what the institutional investors, the big money, <clears throat> and also the individuals, <clears throat> people in the streets, they have to be in sync. It has to be one voice or otherwise that large amount of financing um, won't come to, you know, to, to answer um, solutions to climate change. Mm -hmm. And that goes to the really big concept of, you know, United Nations as leave no one behind as well. So I think we should really involve, you know, both the individual and also the private sector and also the government as well. Thank you, Ken. Um, now we have, you know, so the issue of why, how, and now I want to move on to what. What question? <laughs> and here we go. What are some practical ways to aim for a financial system to align with climate change and green recovery? Uh, Trista? Sure, I mean, there's obviously many things that can, that can be done. Um, and there's some really interesting things that have been happening in the last few years. Um, there's just two that I would mention very quickly. So firstly, um, one of the things that's happened, um, I'd say over the last year or so for, on the corporate side, are what we call sustainability-linked bonds. Um, everybody here is probably very familiar with uh, green bonds. Sustainability-linked bonds are particularly interesting because they really do aim to connect an outcome or an action taken by the company and progress to, um, to basically the terms of how they're borrowing money um, from investors. So uh, there was one that actually was just done for H&M, the large fashion group, um, and it was oversubscribed just for 500 million uh, euros. It was oversubscribed about 7.6 times, uh, which was really a fantastic result. And this has happened multiple times, particularly in the EU over the last year, whether it be on the EU side or the corporate side, a real hunger for these type, this type of financing, which is really interesting, I think. And why is this important? We, you know, we often think about large corporations as well, they have you know, loads of money, um, they do. But um, they often also, you know, as, as Ken mentioned earlier, they have a fiduciary duty as well to, to their investors. So, you know, they have to always be cognizant of the return and they have to balance that with the investments that they make um, as well, and particularly their responsibility to the world. So this helps remove a bit of the argument of we don't have enough money. And this is something that everybody says, even though it seems like everybody has a lot of money, it helps to really kind of perhaps uh, align incentives to encourage companies to invest and to invest in a big way in transforming how they operate. A second thing that I would mention as well is um, I think that uh, on the finance side, we need to start changing our perspective of time, right? And taking a longer term view, you know, finance for many years has been very short term uh, oriented in terms of when we expect returns. Um, I think in general, the financial system moving towards a long term view is, is a really important thing. And it's a bit of a philosophical thing, but it's also a practical thing. And there've been there is an initiative, uh, the Long Term Stock Exchange, actually that launched last year uh, in the U.S., which is a, an an interesting first initiative to do that to really reward companies that take a, a more explicit and longer view. Thank you, Trista. The example of H and M was a really you know clear and then um, really recent example case study as well. Do you have any? Do you have any other case studies as well? Maybe you can just share with us. Yes, actually, yeah. Chanel, uh, mm -hmm. the the fashion house, they did a similar bond last year. It was also oversubscribed, I believe, um, and they raised it so they could do specific sustainability pro uh, projects. And basically, the way this works is. If they don't hit those targets, then they have to pay additional interest uh, to the bondholder. 
at the end of the term. So it really encourages the company to avoid that additional cost by actually performing and doing what they say they're going to do. One of the biggest challenges that we see with sustainability is uh, companies and organizations, whether they be small or large or even other entities, even countries, making promises and not sticking with them. So we have to come up with more incentives and more vehicles to kind of hold them to account and get them to take, take positive actions. And this is a really good commitment, I think, on behalf of, of companies. Right. I really think this is like a new movement for, you know, the organization as well, because this is a new kind of commitment, you know, back yeah. then uh, we, usually we don't talk about climate change or environment when making a commitment, a business commitment, but then now this has to happen. And, you know, all the company has to prove themselves that they can commit to the environment at the same time committing to the business. Thank you, Trista. Uh, Ken-san, what's your thought about this? Well, for a carbon neutral world, <clears throat> um, I'm saying we need three, three pillars, I think. Uh, what one is you need to reduce carbon emissions, right? Um, but let's say if everybody in the world is driving an EV, <clears throat> everybody goes electric. Well, where does the electricity come from? And so, and so there needs to be lots of innovation about generating new source of electricity with, with carbon, less carbon. No carbon for right now. I think it's 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 a little bit difficult for for if if everybody went electric. And so one is that definitely reduce carbon emissions, technology used for that, and that needs financing. The second pillar would be capture and, and recycling carbon. Um, trees do it. Um, and, and people have the, the theoretical <clears throat> um, models there, uh, but to make it uh, more economically viable, there needs to be more innovation in that area, and that needs financing. And the third, which, which is actually a little bit more short term, <clears throat> because it's not so much new innovation or invention, is this concept that Johan mentioned about carbon credit. Um, you can trade the carbon. People that have um, that are uh, that are uh, supplying the carbon to the to the to the world, <clears throat> and people that are um, taking in the carbon, um, they're different different people, and so they can trade the carbon credit. But I think the problem with this is, is that it's a little bit still a little bit complex. And it should be a little bit more simple <clears throat> to, for people to understand. And there needs to be a common language. And, and one initiative, uh, SDG Impact is that one initiative for SDG Impact to come up with a common language. But another for, for business is this um, concept of impact weight accounts, which is basically not just the financial accounting, but trying to incorporate the economic impact and also the social impact into the accounting, uh, which is not currently the way of doing things. But the current way of financial accounting was put into place when there was a big shock <clears throat> during, during the depression eras and where, where companies are asked to be more transparent. And back then, many companies says, oh, we can't do it because there's different kinds of industries. There's different kinds of scale of business. And so it's, com it's hard to come up with one financial accounting for everything. But, but right now, that, that's, that's the norm. And so the current challenge is, is for economic impact and social impact to come up the same kind of consensus that, yeah, there's different kinds of industry, different kinds of scale, <clears throat> but we need to come up with a simple common language and so that we can increase this uh, uh, notion of trading carbon a as a market. And for a market, you, you need a common language. Right. Thank you, Kensum. I think um, transparency is really a key word for you know of this to happen as well. And as thanks to technology, everything is super transparent right now. So um, people are watching our business, people are watching our action, and that's why I think transparency matters a lot in or in order for this to happen. Thank you, Kensum. Uh, lastly, Johan, uh, what's your comment about this? Yeah, I would like to make uh, three points in, in connection to this. First, on, on transparency. You are right, we are much more transparent, but we still have huge information gaps when it comes to, uh, to climate change, investor and corporate behavior and involvement in climate change. Uh, just to give you an example, something as simple as a company's carbon emissions, carbon footprint, and I'm not even talking about the entire supply chain, just the, what, what's sometimes call, uh, called the scope one or scope two carbon emissions. That data is actually only available for uh, 
minority of companies right now. And that, of course, means then that investors do not have the information about the greenness of a company to really make their decisions based on exposure to climate change and also the footprint of a company. So a lot needs to be uh, happening on the disclosure and information side. And um, I think it would be probably the right thing to globally consider um, mandatory disclosures of, of climate metrics for firms as well as investors, something similar to, uh, to financial disclosures. And there is a lot of work happening on that and people have developed standards, but we, are, we still have a very long way uh, to go on adoption of these standards. Secondly, when it comes to financial products, as, as Trista mentioned, there's a lot of interesting things happening, lots of innovation uh, with new products. But again, I think we need there more transparency. I think people need to more often ask the question, what does this actually do for the climate or for the environment? And also it needs to be easier for investors to assess the green credentials of investment products. Uh, there are certainly concerns right now about greenwashing in some um, environmentally friendly so-called financial products. Um, it's not so clear what these products always do for the environment. So we need more clarity and standards there. Um, a further point I'd like to make is uh, we need a carbon price, um, be it through a trading scheme, as Ken mentioned, or simply through taxation of carbon. Uh, because once you put a price on things, that's when, when business and finance reacts to it and um, organizes accordingly. And finally, um, since I speak for an international organization, I think there is a role here also for regulators um, in many different ways. But one way I would mention is through um, the supervision side. Um, so when it comes, for example, to banks, regulators around the world are now working on climate stress tests. And once that is implemented, of course, banks then are forced to think more about climate change risks and portfolios, um, and that will also help. Um, for us to get traction. Thank you, Johan. Just by curiosity, this is the question. This will be a question for all of you. Um, Johan, you mentioned about you know questioning um, how the transparency. When, as an expert, what kind of question or what what kind of matrix that come up to your mind when looking at the company or looking at a product? Uh, maybe Trista, you can help us because sometimes you know when. Well, I'm trying to become as sustainable as, as possible, but then, and then when I go to the supermarket or when I'm looking at a company, um, I question myself, okay, what kind of, you know, supply chain they have, what does, you know, their book business contribute to? Um, I was wondering, you know, what kind of questions pop up, pops up to your mind. Trista? So, I mean, I would, I would certainly agree with you. I, I don't think at the moment we have a real very good framework, right? That's commonly accepted for if you're looking at a particular industry even in their supply chain, what are all the things that you look at? And so for me, some of the things that I would want to see is, you know, going beyond just reporting, you know, we use this much water or this is, you know, this is our, uh, this is our current carbon, carbon footprint. I would really want to see which specific actors are they working with? Which companies are they working with? What are, you know, who are their suppliers? How are they performing? Do they have any issues in terms of, you know, human rights issues or in terms of, you know, are they actually looking to kind of measure their emissions as well? I think it's really important to look at all of those aspects um, throughout the supply chain to really get a good picture in terms of what's actually happening there and making things available for consumers. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Trista. Let me, let me, yeah, let me jump in there. Um, the uh, We were mentioning the uh, SDG Impact, which is an initiative that was launched by UNDP a couple of years ago, still in the works. Um, but the final goal is to come up with a, uh, a set of standards. Um, and if, if a corporation uh, or company that you're talking about uh, is answering to the SDGs, not just climate, but SDGs, um, they'll be awarded a, 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 a seal, impact seal. So it's not it's not a, a reporting kind of standard, transparency kind of standard, but it's more more in, uh, more in, in, in compassing. <clears throat> Basically, the, the the purpose of the corporation is aligned with 
answering to the SDGs? Um, is it, you know, being managed properly in that fashion? Is, is there transparency in that? And also is there governance in that? And so if there's this, you know, the, in, a perf, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an ideal world, uh, if you're going shopping and if the company that is selling it uh, has this UNDP seal on it, it says, ah, oh, <clears throat> this company is answering to the SDGs. And so that, that, that's, that's what the SDG impact, I believe, is trying to reach. Thank you, ken -san. How about you, Johan? Do you have any other questions that you think of? <laughs> um, questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, I think, it, yeah, as, as both Tristan and Ken said, it's, it's about making progress on, on standards, on disclosures. Uh, we need to dig deeper. Um, to really understand the environmental footprint of companies, of, of investment vehicles, um, and even for products, as Ken mentioned, it's not, it's not so easy for, let's say, an electric vehicle. If, it's, if an electric vehicle is powered by uh, electricity that is coming from a coal power plant, it's, it's probably not so green. So these questions are very complex and um, we'll work on understanding and really breaking down the, the environmental impact. Thank you, Han. Since we only have a few minutes left, I want to move on to the very last question, although I'm getting super sad that this session is almost over. But here's my last question. What's the economic impact of climate action? Uh, Johan? Yeah, thanks. Um, actually, I would turn the question around. What would be the impact of not acting? Um, mm -hmm. And, and let's imagine that. And I would think it's very clear if we don't do anything and just keep doing business as usual, by the end of the century, we're heading for disaster. Um, we know that there's of course uncertainty in models, but the general tendency where we are going is, is fairly clear. Um, so that tells me that given that if we don't act, we're heading for disaster, investing into avoiding that disaster and investing into climate change mitigation is a good investment. And um, it seems that uh, quite logically, it makes sense to invest early on, make the progress on the technology. And also, as I mentioned in the beginning, we don't have that much time left. Again, the scientific models tell us. So, so it makes economic sense to act. Uh, climate action is, if you want to speak in finance terms, I think it's a net, um, positive net present value um, undertaking to invest into that. It's good for economic growth. And this is again work that uh, colleagues at the IMF have done where they put this into a big macroeconomic model and, and see what the impact is of investing into avoiding a catastrophic climate change and at the same time raising a carbon crisis. And they show that in the long term, this is positive for economic growth, it's positive for employment. Now, in the short term, there are of course costs. And I think there are, it's also clear there will be disruptions. We shouldn't downplay that. Um, some people will lose their jobs in, in industries that will disappear. There will be reallocation of labor and resources in the economy. So for policymakers here, I think it's important to um, manage that transition to compensate some of the losers to get broader societal buy-in into this transition. And these could, can be things, for example, such as investing in active labor market policies, in uh, unemployment support, in, in bridge support, um, and also help entire regions that might be very dependent on fossil uh, fuel production, for example, to help them transfer into the new age. Um, but overall, I think it's fairly clear that for the planet and for society, the overall impact is really positive from an economic standpoint. Thank you, Johan, for the strong message. I thought I was watching a speech of Oscar, to be honest. <laughs> 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 well, um, final message time. Um, Kenson, final message to the audience, final message to the planet. Sure. Final word. Well, you're talking about economic impact for climate action, right? And, and economic impact is a business risk. And, and the reason why corporations are embracing uh, a neutral, carbon neutral, um, is because they're facing business risk. One, one obvious is reputation risk. 
right? I mean, I mean, because if you're if, if a company is not so friendly towards about carbon neutral, uh, Iblun, you you won't buy their products. <clears throat> so that, 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 that's a, that's a real risk. But if we think about it, because of the climate change, we're seeing these large scale typhoons, hurricanes, floods fires, um, and, and these cause destruction, physical assets of, of a company. <clears throat> so climate change is not something that's gonna be happening from you know, 30, 50, 100 years from now, but it's, it's actually having damage right now. Um, you know, it alters the food chain, it, it, you know, it, it affects agricultural development <clears throat> and, and all kinds of stuff. And so, so it's really real. Um, but I guess the final word is the fact that people looking at economical financial impact, they tend to be short-term because actually you can see the economic financial impact short-term. Uh, a lot of times these changes in climate um, are longer term. You might, you might not feel the impact yourself, but what we need as people of the planet is we need to use one uh, characteristic that was given to us um, from all the living planets Oh, I'm saying all the living organisms in, in this earth, we were given this one precious gift and it's called imagination. Uh, we have to use imagination to say that if you take action now, we can stop this climate change. But if you don't, we'll be going down a different path. Thank you, Ken-san. Johan? Yeah. Um... I agree with everything that Ken has said. Uh, climate change action is ab absolutely crucial. We need to act as soon as possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for me, a centerpiece and, and for many, many experts in, in the IMF is putting a price on carbon because that will help push the entire economy in that direction. So that's really crucial. Financial sector clearly plays a very important role in all of this um, without um, the financial sector and just central planning, we will not be able to achieve this um, and definitely not efficiently. Um, so and as we discussed, we need more progress on transparency, on reporting, on really assessing the climate impact of business activities. Thank you. Trista? Thank you. So I would echo everything that Johan and Ken uh, said, absolutely. Um, I, I wanna re-emphasize that this is a problem. Climate change is a problem that affects everyone, right? And affects all of the different stakeholders. And you know, SDG as 17 advocates for a, a multi-stakeholder approach that's imperative in order to address this problem. So everybody has a role to play. So if you're an individual, you're a consumer, like you mentioned, Ibun San going to that store, and not knowing what to do. Um, it's really important that individuals take, put pressure on um, organizations and companies and products they buy. Um, it really helps to try and change them and move in the right direction. Governments, as I mentioned earlier, um, talked about carbon pricing and how important that is. Um, also working in partnership with different parts of the economy in order to encourage and create a playing field in a situation where companies can innovate, where they can get financing, where they can also um, work towards work towards change. And in the financial sector, we talked about making sure that the financial sector takes a much longer term view. Um, they've moved in a good direction. Like you mentioned, sustainable finance has, has grown dramatically in recent years, but there's just so much more to do. And just in general, how our financial system functions needs a bit of a rehauling. Uh, Ken talked about um, impact weighted accounts, a very important and, and wonderful idea. But I think that, you know, I think we can get there, but it really is going to require a multi-stakeholder collective approach and, and all of us doing our part. Thank you, Trista. I just realized um, you're the, you're the, you're better in moderating this session than I. I don't, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> I was going to comment something, but then to be honest, you commented at all. But yeah, yeah. Um, the session is almost ending, but I just want to say a huge thank you to Ken, um, Johan, and Trista for all of you for your beautiful souls and beautiful presentation. Um, through you know this short period of time, I really realized that it is time for us to reimagine the world. And the more we reimagine, the more we can recreate the world together. And this is the matter of uh, financing for sustainability as well. And though climate action may sound a bit far, but then through this session, I just realized it's so close 
to it's so near to us you know we can just um purchase something that's good for environment we can think about something that, that can make a better environment and better planet as we're all a citizen of this beautiful planet called earth Thank you all for joining us and thank you, um, you know, all the audiences from all around the world for listening um, to our session. And yes, I just want to say a thank you. Arigatou gozaimasu in Japanese to close this session. Thank you.